This is the first Sunday of Advent. There are four Sundays of Advent, the four Sundays that lead up to Christmas. Lighting the first candle is really about expectation, anticipation, and hope of good stuff in the future. Now, in the Christian faith, it is the anticipation and the expectation and the hope of the coming of the Messiah that the Old Testament prophets predicted would happen. But in the rest of the world, and certainly in America, it has expanded beyond waiting for expectation and anticipation and hope of the coming of the Messiah. We are also in expectation, anticipation, and hope of the coming of Santa. (laughs) And for us that are older, our parents, our grandparents, our neighbors, our friends, we are also in the hope and the anticipation and the expectation that we will all be ready by December 25th for Santa's arrival. Because let's face it, there's a lot to get done between now and then. Is that true? We have Christmas cards. We have gifts to buy and wrap. We have cookies to bake. We have parties to go to. We have uh, office parties, white elephant exchanges. We have performances to go to, our kids' performances, our grandkids' performances, shows that we have tickets to. (sighs) can wear you down. If you don't watch it, it can put you into a frenzy. And then there's the other side of the coin that also happens during this time of year. The loneliness, the depression, the feeling disconnected even when I'm with a lot of people. The feeling of, I just wish I had somebody to love me, somebody with me. That also seems to get underlined during this time of year. So I have some thoughts for you today about the holidays and how to live them in the middle. Not on one side in the frenzy, not on the other side in depression, but in the middle. Living in the middle is a concept of Buddhism. How to live in the middle. Centered, being centered, connecting to your center and being with that centeredness. Because when we get to that centeredness, living in the middle, we can actually enjoy the holiday season, which to me is the goal. So I want to talk a little bit about how we have gotten off center first. Because it used to be, back in the day, at least back in my day, and in a lot of your days as well, that there were very few careers that had this expectation of 24-7. There were doctors that made house calls. There were ministers that made house calls for emergencies. There were firefighters and a few other small little businesses. But basically, when I grew up, people worked 40 hours a week. They had an eight-hour job, and then they came home. They had downtime. They were off the clock. Nowadays, not. So much. I don't know if you noticed, but with the internet and email and uh, the computer that you get to bring home from work and the phone you get to bring home from work, we actually have blurred the lines between what is work life and what is private life. And I know I'm guilty. I'll do my emails at midnight. Things have shifted as far as, you know, what is uh, work and what is pleasure. Now the thing I think that caused all this was technology, of course. Technology has thrown us off center a little bit. Not just in work though, in play as well. Nowadays you can watch a movie at 3 o'clock in the morning. You can um, shop online 24 hours a day. You can play video games all night long. Now, when I was growing up, that was impossible. For you younger people, the TVs turned off. There wasn't anything that went on after midnight. The stores closed. The gas stations closed. There weren't any 24-hour restaurants. There really weren't very many restaurants 
at all, but they all closed after dinner time. So, first thing I want to say to you, if you are in a franticness during the holidays right now, I would suggest turning off your technology for just a couple hours and seeing what that's like. I recommend a program to my clients um, called the Hoffman Process. It's a seven-day self-awareness, wonderful, wonderful program. If you want more information, I'll be glad to give it to you. And um, there, they take your technology for seven days. They ask you to turn over your cell phone. And when I tell my clients that, they're like, oh, no, I can't do that. And I said, well, I think you'll want to. And as a matter of fact, you do want to when you're there. And when they want to give it back to you after seven days, you don't really want it. It's like, oh no, it's been so nice not to have to stay connected to everything all the time. So technology needs to slow down during this time because so much more needs to get done in our lives. Another thing that I think has gotten us off center is our culture's kind of obsession with speeding things up. I don't know if you've noticed, but we've gotten faster and faster and faster as the years are going by. For example, kindergartners now, five-year-olds, are expected to learn how to read. Now in Sweden, they don't start reading until eight years old because it's actually not developmentally appropriate. Some people's brains develop earlier, but others don't develop until about seven or eight years old, appropriate enough to learn how to read. Now in Sweden, they don't have any reading disabilities. They don't have dyslexia. And we have it all over the place because we're trying to hurry our kids up to learn to read before it's appropriate. What about high school kids? High school kids are supposed to be taking college courses now. Our older son in ninth grade at 14 years old came home and said, Mom, would you mind if I changed out of the dual credit class that I'm in to the on-level class? And I said, what do you mean dual credit? He goes, well, I get high school credit and also college credit. He was 14, ninth grade. I said, how did you get in that class? We did not approve of that. You can, what? Of course get out of there. I said, honey, when you are college age, guess what? You'll take college classes. Not at 14. That's crazy. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Why? With computerization, we're expected to get more done in less time. Why? I'm going to tell you a story that Bruce Chapman tells. It's about a white explorer in Africa. So there's this man. He goes to Africa. He hires local porters to help him get to this destination that he wants to go to. And he is very anxious to get there. He only has so much vacation time. He needs to get there. And so he pays them extra money to go faster and go farther every single day. And as they get very close to their destination... The porters quit. They stop. They sat down. They set their things down. And they say, we cannot go any further. And no amount of money would make them go further. They said simply, they had to wait for their souls to catch up. Have you ever felt that way? That you're running so fast that you feel like I left my soul behind. I'm disconnected from myself. I loved what you said today, Lou. I'm talking today for myself. Yes, we need to have some connection to that self. But sometimes we're trying to get so much done that we just fall in bed exhausted at nighttime and sleep like a rock and know tomorrow morning i got to wake up and do it all over again. Even more so in December, we're going fast, fast, fast. So how do we slow down? How do we stop that manic cultural thing that says more, 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 fast, fast, fast? The poet Rumi tells us, live in silence. Flow down and down in ever-winding rings of being. 
Now, the key word there is being. How do we move from human doings to human beings? UU Minister Matt Alspo explains being this way. How can we balance our need to do in order to stay alive with the need to be in order to be alive? This is the spiritual challenge of finding the balance, of living in the middle, the balance between our need to do in order to stay alive and our need to be in order to be alive. Matt is about ready to embark on a month-long sabbatical from his church. And he was told by one of his spiritual leaders, don't try to write anything. Don't try to catch up on your reading. Don't read your emails. Don't actually do anything. Just practice being. Which I think is a great piece of advice during the holidays. Take five minutes a day to practice being. Another way of saying that is living in the moment. Not to get ahead of yourself, not to live in the past, but living right now, right here, where we are, right now, in the moment, connecting to that. And I know that it's hard to deal with in December. It's extra hard to do. But I know it's possible because it happened to me this week. Here's my story. Last week, a week ago, I was frantic for all the stuff that I haven't done for Christmas. It's December 3rd. I haven't written one one card at all. In fact, we haven't even had our family picture done for, and my husband's a photographer, we haven't had our picture done yet for our cards. I haven't bought any uh, gifts at all, and ours have to be sent away, a lot of them, for our family. And we haven't put up our Christmas tree and we haven't decorated outside or put any lights up at all. And last Sunday, we were out of town, and I was starting to wig on all that. I was starting to amp it up, saying, we've got to get back. We've got all this stuff that we've got to do. And then Monday, lies splashed me in the face. We got a phone call from our son who said that his wife, our daughter-in-law, her brother just died suddenly. Like you, Don, grieving. And suddenly all that stuff, he was 36 years old, he left behind a wife, a two-year-old, and a five-year-old. And all that stuff that I had been worried about, stressed about, excited about, just went poof off my radar and I ended up being right here right in the moment with my son with my daughter-in-law with her mother because none of that stuff mattered anymore got connected to the right now now I don't want life to have to splash a little bit on your face for you to do that what I want instead is for you to do something that Sylvia Bornstein suggests. She's a Buddhist teacher, and she wrote a book called Don't Just Do Something, Sit There. And that's what I want to encourage you to do. Don't just do something this week, sit there. Take five minutes out of your day every day to just be connected to yourself, the seat that you're sitting on, and the present. Live in the silence, as Rumi says. Dwell in the being. Be in the center of now. So I want to end with one last point that has gotten us off center. One more suggestion of how to get back in the middle. And the last thing that I think has gotten us off center is stuff. Stuff, stuff, stuff. Consumerism. December is full of it. If you go down to the mall, there is not one parking place, even out to the street. Consume, consume, consume. Buy stuff, buy stuff, buy stuff. So I read a story on the UUA website about balance. 
And here it is. So Ray asked his mother, what do you want for your birthday? Well, that was a surprisingly hard question to answer. He thought to himself, what do I want for my birthday? He said, I don't know, Mom. Can I get back with you on that? And she said, sure. Ray grabbed his skateboard and he went out to the driveway to ride so he could think about this most important question. What do I want for my birthday? He said it deserved his most thoughtful thinking. Ray remembered back to the year before his birthday when he got his skateboard and how thrilled he was. He barely had time to say, oh, thank you, before he picked up his skateboard and he raced to the phone and he called his best friend, Victor, and said, I've got a skateboard. We can ride together now. Come on over. And Victor came right away. He remembered when Victor came over He said, I will teach you if you remember one thing. It's all about balance. And balance is all about knowing where your center is. Funny, thought Ray, as he was skateboarding today. He was skateboarding remembering how many hours he's practiced his tricks in the driveway, how much he has enjoyed riding that skateboard, and how good he has gotten in one year. And he thought, it is all about balance, isn't it? It's all about staying on center. And it's funny because I feel on center, balanced when I'm riding my skateboard. This is where I feel most connected to myself, to my soul, who I really am. What do I want for my birthday? What could ever duplicate that ever again, he wondered. And then he had a flash of a thought, and he thought of a program that his church started, the First Unitarian Church of Rochester, New York, started something for people to do something different at Christmas time. Every family in the congregation was asked to think about, and I would have you think about, what you would usually spend on Christmas presents. Everybody was asked, what is that amount that you would usually spend on Christmas presents? And then they were asked to cut it in half and to give half of that amount to a special fund at the church called the Greater Good Program. Ray had been amazed that his little congregation had raised $64,000. The money went to local families and families in the church that were struggling and needed help. It also went to a village in Honduras for them to work on fresh water. Now, Ray, being a kid, had worried about this idea at first. Only half a Christmas? But it turned out that it was a whole Christmas. And the feeling he got from helping other people more than compensated for not having quite as many gifts to open. So he began to wonder... What would it be like to have half a birthday? Maybe it would be pretty good, he thought. Hey, Ray, someone called him. It was his friend Sebastian. Sebastian and he went to school together, but they didn't play together after school because Sebastian was not a skateboarder. How could Ray relate? And he said, oh, hi, Sebastian, what are you doing? And Sebastian said, nothing, just hanging out. But Ray noticed Sebastian eyeing his skateboard. And he said, would you like to try it? Sebastian said, oh, I'd love to, but I don't know how to do it. And it sure looks hard. Ray said, well, I could teach you. I could show you. So he showed him how to plant his left foot and push off with his right foot, plant his left foot, push off. And he found himself saying the same words that had been said to him. It's all about balance. It's all about finding your center, rather like life. By the time Ray had to go home, Sebastian had gotten pretty good at the skateboard. And he gave it back to Ray with a big smile and said, Thank you so much. And Ray told him, Hey, you know what? You should get a skateboard. 
you could ride with us then. You could ride with me and Victrum. Oh, that'd be cool, said Sebastian. I don't think that's going to happen. There's not a lot of money at my house for big presents like that. But I did have fun learning. Thanks a lot. And he went into his building. Ray watched him and felt sad. He thought to himself, it isn't fair that some kids get to have a skateboard. And some kids who would love to have a skateboard don't get to have a skateboard. And he thought to himself, it's not fair that some kids who want to play sports get to play sports. And some kids' families can't afford the fees or the costume, the outfit, or the equipment. Suddenly, Ray knew what he wanted for his birthday. He skateboarded home, and he told his mom, Mom, I know what I want. I want a half birthday. And he told her all about his idea about building a fund for sports for kids. What a great idea, his mom said. I think we could get people at church to help us. Well, could it be a part of the greater good program, Ray asked? Because there are lots of people at church, and every single one of them has a birthday, not just the kids. What if everybody had a half birthday and took the other half and donated it to the greater good program at church? And that's what they did. What if we did that? What if we did that here? What if we thought of how much money are we going to spend on Christmas gifts this year? Cut it in half and started a greater good program here. I have people that call me and ask me for money to pay their electric bill. We don't really have a fund that does that here. I have to send them to Emerson where they do have a fund. What if we had a half Christmas and got reconnected to our center and started a greater good program here. I would like to do that. I am in. I don't know if any of you are in. I know it probably has to be passed by the board. I'm always throwing things at them that they're not prepared for. But I am for it and would like to do that. If you are as well, please let me know. And let's start a greater good program here, right here in our fellowship, to get connected to our center. So I have three thoughts for you today to get back to those values and back to who you are and back to what you stand for and living in the middle. Turn off the technology if you're too revved up. Number one. Number two, slow things down and live in the silence for five minutes a day. And number three, cut down on that consumerism in order to participate in a greater good program. My expectation, my anticipation, and my hope is that you will do all three and that therefore you'll be able to reconnect to your center and enjoy the holidays. Blessed be and amen. As you go on your way this week, remember that connecting to that center, connecting to your values, connecting to who you are will open the door to the joy and the hope and all the good things that are ahead for you. Blessed be.